Hello, my name is Brian Grubbs. I'm the manager of local history and genealogy at the Springfield Green County Library District. Today, we have Jeffrey Patrick presenting Love in a Time of War, an American Sailor in Scotland in Northern Ireland, 1942. Jeffrey Patrick is the curator, curator at Wilson's Creek National Battlefield in Republic, Missouri. He has a master's of art degree in history from Purdue University. Jeff is the author or editor of numerous books and articles on US military history. Jeff, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Brian. 22 year old Pennsylvanian Vernon Malcolm Richardson began his service in the United States Navy on March 30th, 1942. Less than two months later, the young yeoman, a sailor who did clerical and administrative work, boarded a transport to sail to Europe. His destination was the heavy cruiser USS Wichita. Richardson did not report aboard the Wichita until July 31st, 1942, allowing him ample time to explore and interact with the people of Northern Ireland and Scotland. Richardson kept a detailed personal diary of his experiences in the British Isles, a practice forbidden by Navy regulations, but a prohibition ignored by many servicemen and women. It is a unique account of a young serviceman's travels, thoughts, and feelings, his impressions of America's ally, and most intimately, his details of a budding romance with one of those allies. Vernon Malcolm Richardson was a native of Langhorne, Pennsylvania, who graduated from Temple University and attended the Wharton School of Finance at the University of Pennsylvania. When he enlisted in 1942, Richardson was working as a clerk stenographer at the Delaware River Joint Toll Bridge Commission, headquartered in Trenton, New Jersey. Interestingly, he came from a Quaker family, a religious sect traditionally opposed to war. Richardson's first stop on his journey in the British Isles was the U.S. Naval Operating Base at Londonderry, where he arrived on June 13, 1942. He noted the beautiful, lush, green scenery around the city. Mountains in the distance reminded him of the Poconos of his native Pennsylvania. Although the landscape seemed very familiar, the local population was quite different. Not long after he arrived, Richardson went on liberty and attended a dance. Afterward, he recorded his initial impressions of the people of Northern Ireland. They do American dances just like home, but the numbers they play are all old ones at home, Richardson wrote in his diary. Once in a while, they do an Irish dance. Some girl tried to show me how to do one and I got through it okay. Like many young men far from home, Richardson noticed the local girls. He found them to be rougher than American girls. They smoke like steam engines, go without stockings because of rationing, and butt their cigarettes and stick them behind their ears, he noted. You see some pretty girls, but they are fewer than at home, he continued. The Irish try to imitate American girls so they can make the soldiers and sailors. Many go without makeup. I don't know whether it's scarce or whether they never did use it. They all like the Yanks. They marvel at our money and the food we eat. Richardson quickly realized that Quote, real silk stockings are an enormous luxury and they will buy most anything here. How the sailors do wish they had brought a few pairs along. Following another dance, Richardson and a comrade walked two girls home, actually only near their homes. You can't walk them home for if a girl takes a fellow to her house here, the family thinks they are contemplating marriage, he explained. He found that both girls were curious about American sailors and asked them many questions. They didn't know why we were fighting Japan, he noted. They had never heard of the Pearl Harbor disaster. They admitted their papers were filled with propaganda and strictly censored. They like Yankees, but know little of the states and the people there and customs. All Americans are thought to be wealthy or rich to these people here. The American sailors found that real liquor was scarce in Ireland. The bars have wine on display. It is rationed, Richardson wrote. Whiskey is bootlegged for $6 a quart. It is made from potatoes or something, just like in our prohibition days at home, he explained. It will make you blind and whatnot. Real bonded whiskey, rye, is hard to find. They draw the beers from a keg on its side. No taps or coils or ice boxes. It is cool from water around the keg. You often get a lot of dregs. Richardson soon ventured outside Londonderry as well to explore neighboring farms and estates. The Irish have large families, and everyone, men, women, girls, and boys ride bikes. Horses with polished wooden carts appeared in quantity. On Sunday, quote, the people were really dressed up for church in their best. 
We were ganged with little boys from one farmer's house who asked for pennies and souvenirs and followed us along the road, telling us the birds, flowers, which were out all over, especially the wild roses, dandelions, daisies, violets, buttercups, etc., and crops and all about their lives, school, home, food, etc. Not all of Richardson's visits with the Irish were so positive, however. Some were a bit too willing to share their views on Americans. They think we have a lot of racial prejudice, think we are superior to others, and would like us to say America is not what it's cracked up to be, Richardson complained. They think our Coca-Cola is all right, but they have all, all have an idea, probably from the American movies, that the states are infested with gangsters who shoot you on sight after dark from speeding cars. I think these cheap detective magazines that filter in with the troops and are read by the people give them that impression. They all think the Americans are heavy drinkers and do nothing but drink and spend money. Even more upsetting, some Irish girls asked our boys, what are you going to do, uh, what are you going to, do to find enough hiding places for the Yankees while the poor Limeys go to the front and get killed? That infuriates the Yanks. If a fellow ever told a Yank that he would have a nice fight on his hands, but the girls get away with it. Such negative opinions prompted Richardson to reflect on the patriotism of his fellow Americans. I really am glad I'm an American, he confided to his diary on June 22nd. I wonder if the people in the States will ever appreciate their country, homes, and luxuries and opportunities like these boys do now that have spent time here. They all realize that a country like ours is really worth fighting for. I wonder if the people around where I live realize any more than they did that a war is going on. I wonder if they are more conscious of it than they were when I left. We all hope so. We wonder if the American flag means as much to the average civilian at home as it does to any serviceman when they raise the colors and everyone stands at attention as the bugle blows. I have actually seen tears come to eyes of some of the sailors as they stood at rigid salute. It touches them that deeply. They were lost here for a long time for they didn't have our flag up and it is really amazing how happy it made the boys to see Old Glory. Richardson's enthusiasm for the war faced a test on July 2nd, when he heard a radio broadcast that claimed the Germans were a mere 50 miles from Alexandria, Egypt, and ready to capture the important Suez Canal. We sure felt bad when we heard that, he admitted. We heard rebroadcasts and explanations of Ch Churchill's speech, and it really was a gloomy tale of how the British took a licking from inferior numbers and armor and guns. If the Germans take Egypt and the Suez Canal, we all know that half the war will be lost. The British commentators all sound beaten or solid, sullen or placid. Richardson's frustration with spending the war in Ireland and with his British allies now boiled over. The boys here are burned inside. They hate this place. Many want action. Another broadcast tonight told of supplies reaching Murmansk, Russia, though losses of ships has been heavy. Tonight, as I lay here, I know I shan't sleep much tonight. Your blood boils as you hear these bad defeats and retreats, and all the boys repeat is, they need a few Yanks. You might think the Germans couldn't be stopped anywhere the way they kicked the Limeys around, he continued. We'll stop them. Oh, God, save our country and give us the strength. The English seem so docile about it all, so slow and formal about everything. We shall stand by them as our allies at all costs, but we feel that they lack the sting and fighting quality of the Yanks. They seem to have plenty of guts, but they are too conventional, old-fashioned, and sticking to old rules and chivalrous customs. Our men would probably hold every limey as his friend if they had won a great battle sometime and not continually retreated. Well, we sure hope the British hold Egypt and that our second front starts soon. The sooner, the better. On July 3, 1942, Richardson left Londonderry, carrying orders to join the Wichita at Scapaflow, Scotland. His train arrived in Glasgow early the following morning. The tired sailor walked through the blacked out city toward the Buchanan Street station, where he was to find his next train. A young Scot, about 17 years old, offered to carry Richardson's sea bag and hammock. When they found the station closed, Richardson paid him, but the young man wanted more. He stood there looking at me and started to ask me how the Yanks were back home, if all the Yanks were rich, what New York was like, if I had ever seen Gene Autry, if cowboys still carried guns in the West, and if they still rode horses and had gunfights, if I ever saw Wild Bill Hickok, if I had ever seen the gangsters in Chicago, and a thousand other questions 
Richardson remembered. Finally, the American gave the lad a cigarette and the young Scot bid Richardson cheerio and departed. After sitting outside the station for about a half hour, a station worker approached Richardson and urged him to come into the station garage where it was warmer. He offered the sailor a bunk used by air raid wardens between their watches. A round, jovial-faced fire watcher then entered the room and invited Richardson next door for a cup of tea. He gave me some sugar and put cream in my tea, they all drink it with cream, and settled down again to ask me how I liked it here and what I thought of the people, country, and the war, he recalled in his diary. He told me that he had lived in London and had a very good business but was bombed out and, had, and he had to move to Glasgow with his wife. This well-educated World War I veteran spoke fine English and was very kind and had a good sense of humor. Richardson drank his tea, ate some crumpets, and slept in a chair until 5 a.m. He woke me then and told me that no train left there at 5.15, but one did at the Central Station. I got a cab and went to Central. Richardson's train headed for Perth, where he tra changed trains for Inverness. He shared his compartment with three Norwegian so soldiers who were serving in the British Army. I was amazed when the Norwegians conversed in Norse language for thought them to be British soldiers at first, he recalled. I thought they were speaking the old Gaelic tongue, which is still spoken quite a bit in some parts of Scotland and Southern Ireland. He shared his cigarettes and chocolate bars, both prized commodities in Britain. When the train pulled into the station, Richardson was not ready for yet another surprise. When we pulled in, I noticed many soldiers in kilts, as well as civilians. Also two Asiatic Indian Sikh soldiers with turbans on, he, he recorded. I never have seen such handsome men as those Indians. In my mind, they are the most handsome men in the world. They have a light brown complexion, just slightly darker than a white man with a deep tan and a richer brown color. They looked very neat and were clean shaven and spoke their native tongue. Their hair is a jet black and it is straight and shiny. They have a smooth complexion and flashing brilliant black eyes. Their eyebrows and their mustaches looked as if they were painted on. So perfect were they. Continuing on toward Inverness, Richardson saw land desolate and bleak and barren. Nothing at all but a little grass and moss and sheep. They have sheepdogs minding the cattle and sheep. How people exist and want to live here, I don't know. He spied only a few roads near the lonely, widely separated farmhouses. Arriving at Thurso, the dirty and tired Richardson was directed to the city hall. After enjoying expensive drinks at a local pub, Richardson and a British sailor went to the Salvation Army to get a meal. We got a piece of bacon, chips, bread, tea, Richardson recounted. The bacon was rancid and fat. The bread here is all dark bread. White bread is a tremendous luxury and can't be had. I noticed that everyone here eats with both hands, he curiously wrote a fork in the right hand and a knife in the left hand to push up a fork full of food. That is English custom. They eat with their fork upside down. They watched me eat with a fork and my bread in the left hand and just smiled. After washing up, the men went to a dance. Unlike his earlier experiences, I had an awful time, he complained, since they danced entirely different from me and couldn't follow me. The people here didn't like Yankees much and are more aloof to you than the other Scotch I have seen. They won't speak and would rather not bother with you. They look at you with a sort of contempt. Some of the Scotch are very hard to understand. On July 5th, Richardson finally arrived at Scapa Flow, where he was to join the Wichita when the ship returned from uh, Halfordur, Iceland. Quartered on a floating dock with British petty officers until the Wichita returned, Richardson longed for a 10-day leave to Glasgow. There is nothing here. It's a fine place to go crazy, and they say many do that who stay here long. All we do here is read and sleep. In addition to getting used to tea and crumpets and sleeping in a hammock, Richardson became familiar with his British sailor counterparts, all combat veterans. I talked with the British pet petty officers a while, and they told of all kinds of experiences and circumstances which they had been through in this war, he wrote. They talked of the bombings at home and in the Navy, Dunkirk, where most of them saw service, of the Mediterranean uh, and where they had been in the States before the war. They are fine fellows and I liked them much more than I ever believed I would. This close interaction increased Richardson's admiration for the British sailor, men very similar to him. 
I noticed how carefree the petty officers were and how little fear or concern they show for the war, bombs, and torpedoes. They merely think of it as a routine job and laugh as they tell of ships being blown in half and still reaching port. One of the petty officers just borrowed a pencil from me and asked what I thought of the British Navy. I told him it was okay and he remarked, yes, but it could stand a lot of improvement. It seems to be the British fighting forces trouble is their old fashioned and incompetent leaders rather than the men. They're as brave a lot as you'd find. Richardson soon learned that the British civilians were just as fearless. He was told that the children had no fear of bombs after a few raids and would stand their guard with the women and throw the small incendiaries into the street from houses and buildings just as they were lit. It is the same that the elderly gentleman told me the other night in Glasgow. The public has become calloused to bombing. I wonder if America could take that in stride if it had to, like these people. They are absolutely fearless. There is no sign of panic or danger. They work coolly and deliberately. They like to laugh and joke. With the Wichita still at sea, orders arrived on July 9th, sending Richardson back to Londonderry. Assigned to office work, he admitted that it is getting very tiresome to not be settled anywhere and always having to be ready to move at any minute. I sure hope I get settled before too long and am assigned definitely to one place for a while, he wrote in his diary. I talked to some of the boys on the base here this morning and got their views on the sea. Some want to go to sea badly. They have the itch and want to move. Others are rather timid about the North Atlantic and would rather stay here. Personally, they are wise. The Murmansk route is a dreaded route to all sailors who have been on it. Some would choose the safety of this base to anything. I have gotten so I don't care which I get now. I would like to be in the Caribbean or West Coast fleet rather than here too. Such uncertainty about the future led to disciplinary problems, as Richardson documented on July 20th. A sailor who had been on a hunger strike for five days was planning to plead insanity in order to leave Londonderry. They try all sorts of gags and ruses to get back to the States, and we all suspect that his antics point to that idea, Richardson noted. Far worse, someone was facing a summary court-martial almost every day for such charges as, quote, wrecking a Navy car, driving while drunk, AWOL, trying to run away, disobedience of orders, having girls in huts or Navy vehicles, fighting in town while on liberty, stealing, and other charges. Sentences range from suspension of liberty for a couple of weeks to fines up to $200 and time in the brig, to 20 days bread and water, to solitary confinement, and D-rating. One fellow I know has had six court martials in the past nine months. On July 25th, Richardson left the base and had an opportunity to talk with a group of British soldiers in a pub. They can't figure how we aren't starting the second front, he reported. They say that they are just fooling around, training here, and have been here for over two years. They want a second front immediately and are ready to fight. They chide hell out of their leaders in the army. I've definitely come to the conclusion that the British Army's leadership is to blame for everything. Certainly the men are all right. It needs a going over and complete shakeup. After his discussion in the bar, Richardson went to a crowded dance. I don't know whether we're becoming used to the girls here or not, he concluded but I know that I saw what seemed to be a number of attractive ones last night at the dance. They told us we'd feel that way after staying here a while. I know that at first they all looked terrible to us. I know that they are dolling up more now and using more makeup since the Americans came over here in number. They never dressed or tried to make themselves very attractive before. They found that they have to, to get the Yanks, and they all want to do that. On July 27, 1942, orders arrived for Richardson to return to Scapa Flow to wait again for the Wichita. He fully anticipated that once he joined the heavy cruiser, he would be helping escort supply convoys to Russia through U-boat infested waters. I know what is in store for me, icy weather, subs, planes, torpedoes, bombs, and a regular hell, he, he predicted, but it's going to be part of my job and everyone must do his job well in these times. The depressing war news did not encourage any of the sailors with Richardson. The fellows who camp here curse and growl about our country wasting time and letting them lie around where they aren't doing anything important. Actually, they are doing important things, but they mean they, that they aren't fighting. They all say we haven't won a battle yet, and it is getting to be a predominant feeling here that we will lose the war if we haven't already. 
Naturally, that kind of talk is bad for morale, but that's how they feel, think, and what they fear. Everyone here is begging, praying, asking for a second front to relieve the Russians and pound Germany from another angle inside. I have no doubt that what, what I'll see a lot of action if and when they start the second front. My ship will undoubtedly support a landing and the preparation for another front. Oh, well, it's all in a lifetime. May God preserve our country and its freedom, even though we lose or die trying to win. Richardson arrived in Edinburgh on July 30th and found it a very pretty city. The girls are pretty and everyone seems more like Americans in dress, custom, and looks than any place I've been so far. The following day, he finally reported on board the Wichita. On August 1st, he left the ship and went to a dance sponsored by the Red Cross. It was his best dance experience yet. We had sandwiches, Coca-Cola, ice cream, cakes, and there were swarms of good looking girls there. They had an RAF band. They really are some of the most beautiful girls I've ever seen here in Scotland. A few nights later, Richardson went to the Red Cross for supper and was served by a pretty girl he had danced with earlier at the Red Cross event. I asked her to go out after she finished and she agreed. Eleanor Simpson was surely a beautiful little gal when she is dressed up. She has dark hair and eyes. After drinks, they walked through the park and sat down on a bench to chat. We talked a while. She never thought much of sailors, thinking them to be all alike according to the old peacetime sailor's reputation, he noted. I finally persuaded and convinced her that you can't judge them as all alike, and we talked about everything in general. Romance was in the air for the young American. Richardson quickly learned that Eleanor was well-read and educated and came from a respectable family. She speaks very much like an American from working with them, is very neat and clean and speaks excellent English. She is more like an American girl in another respect and that she can't cook, but likes to work. Most Scotch girls cook well. Finally, after leaving my arm around her for some time, I mustered enough nerve to kiss her. And wow, what a kiss. I've never been kissed like that before in my life my life. I'll never forget it if I live to be 102. Richardson was clearly smitten. He rode on the bus with her to her home. I couldn't go to, go to sleep right away, he admitted. I made a date with her for Thursday night. Am I anticipating that date? The night before their second date, he confided in his diary that Eleanor was in my mind all day. I can't wait to have that date with her. I would like to see her every night the way I feel just now. She wants to come to the States for a vacation after the war. Who knows, I may become very much attached to her in the future. Their date on August 6th went well, and Richardson recorded it in detail in his diary. Had dinner with Eleanor. Dinner over here is a very slight expense compared with home. Also, you get very little variety. We had bacon, chips, salad, and coffee, and toast for 80 cents all told. We then went down in the grill and had a couple of gins and sat there and talked. She looked very pretty in a red plaid suit and green trimmings at the collar, wore crepe sole shoes and a white silk blouse. The more I see of her, the more I think of her. She really is one fine girl. She has about everything I want in a woman except that she can't cook, but wants to learn. It certainly wouldn't be hard for me to love her, though I'm not saying anything like that yet or thinking too much about it. She has a wonderful personality, a good conversationalist, and knowledge in variety. She's cute, thoughtful, very inexpensive, doesn't drink a lot, smokes very little, and et cetera, et cetera. She's a very broad-minded girl and has an aristocratic air and poise, though she doesn't act like a stuffed shirt. We had, I mean, I had a few ales after the gin ran out, and she only took the two drinks. I could go on forever in detail. We sat and talked for a long time and listened to the music. We really were going to dance, but we stayed so long that we gave up the idea. The places here don't come up to our places at home, but the customers have deteriorated with the large influx of servicemen of all nationalities here in Britain who go everywhere and get drunk and loud and curse and act mighty damn disgusting at times. However, you find that in every place you go over here, regardless of the rank of the place. We went out of there about 10 p.m. and walked around the lower castle wall and then sat down in the park a while. Everyone over here sits on the grass in the park in the evening and all the couples do their loving there regardless of who's around. They hide nothing over here. We sat and kissed a while and talked some more. Man, I've never kissed a girl that could kiss like this one, none. She was telling me a lot about her family and sister and brothers. 
She invited me to come to tea with her family on Saturday afternoon and told me how to find the estate. From what I gather, her family is quite well-to-do. Her father doesn't think much of sailors, but she wants me to meet her family. Oh, if you could see me now, I'll have to scrub my damned old blues till they are worn out to look top-notch on Saturday. I'm really looking forward to it with zeal and anticipated delight. I'm only worried about one thing. They have different silver for so many things and uses over here that I'm afraid I'll miscue and use the wrong fork, knife, or spoon. We talked so long in the park or kissed so much that we had to run to catch the last bus. I got into a conversation with her about why she kissed me on the first real date, and I got the following answer. Well, I am told that Americans will never bother asking a girl out again if she doesn't give them a kiss or two, and I wanted to see you again, so I really did something I wouldn't ordinarily have done. She's just about right, too. As if the night wasn't exciting enough, there was one more thrill in store. We got on the bus and after riding about a mile, the air raid sirens went off. It's the first time I've actually heard them over here. They're a weird sound that sends chills up your back. All the blackout curtains were pulled down and everyone seemed very calm and collected, except for a few. The bus went right on as usual. I came to this, the town finally and kissed Eleanor goodnight and told her I'd see her Saturday afternoon. I really am looking forward to that. I doubt if I've ever enjoyed anyone's company more than her. She has promised to send me a picture of herself. I think she likes me okay. I've never made the mistake again of going head over heels for a girl like I did once. I talked to the conductor coming back and saw the searchlight spear into the sky for the planes and could hear intermittent anti-aircraft flak and night fighter cannon bursts. They chased the raiders off before any damage was done. It is significant what they wish to bomb. Edinburgh is not industrial, but the Rosyth docks where our ship is and the newest British battleship, Bahau, as well as others, are tied up there now. They didn't accomplish their mission. I heard the all clear sound on the way back. I really had no fear whatsoever, but I suppose I'd have to wash my pants out if a bomb dropped near me. However, I know what to do and how to protect myself. I went to bed at midnight quite excited, happy, and dreamy. I said my prayers and went to sleep. I know that Edinburgh is the nicest city I've ever hit abroad. The people, their tops. On Saturday, August 8, 1942, it was time to meet Eleanor's parents. I was ready at the first Liberty call and went ashore. I took my pea coat, caught the train to Edinburgh, and checked my gas mask at the Red Cross. I took the bus immediately. I arrived there at about 2.45 and started walking up the street from the bus stop, intending to ask the first person I met where the Simpsons lived. I asked a man, and he was Mr. Simpson, Eleanor's father, and he called me by name and shook hands. He was a man about 50 with thinning hair, straight and husky build with clear, dark eyes. He directed me to the house and said that he had target practice with the home guard, he being a member of it. I went up the street and turned the next corner and found the house. It's a medium-sized, neat, clean-looking brick house with a very neat, well-kept lawn and flowers and surrounded by a brown picket fence. This is a small residential village. The houses are stone and the streets narrow and winding. It is an old village, very quaint. I walked up the winding gravel path well-edged to the door. A big, well-polished brass knocker was in the center of a heavy brown oak door. The steps were painted with the white mortar and a doormat lay before the door. I knocked and was confronted by a kind looking woman with gray hair of about 50. She was not fat nor old looking, welcomed me by first name and bade me step in. She was well dressed but wore an apron. I entered and was ushered into the dining room and seated myself in an easy chair by the fireplace. Eleanor greeted me and we sat down and talked a minute or two. Then Eleanor's older sister, married to a Norwegian who was a lieutenant commander in the Navy, came in and I was introduced to her. She's a beautiful woman of about 25 with very dark, flashy eyes and hair. They all made me feel very much at home and were very good talkers. They are all well-educated. The house was very clean and neat inside, not luxuriant, but easily the home of well-to-do people over here. They have fireplaces in each room since central heating is a rarity here. The fireplaces burn coal and throw out a lot of heat. They are smaller, much, than ours at home and have little dirt or ash. I sat and talked to them for some time and they asked me many questions about the Navy, home, etc. 
I never expected to feel so much at home and at ease among strangers in such a short time. Presently, Gordon, Eleanor's only brother, a fellow about 27, handsome, dark, agile, and quick, came in and I met him. He is a mechanical engineer, was well-dressed in sport clothes, and immediately started a conversation with me. He insisted that I smoke his cigarettes and ask me questions in comparing U.S. with Scotland and its customs. He's the sort of fellow you just can't dislike and has a fine personality, but impresses me as one whom you must convince perfectly before he would accept you as a close friend. He showed me some model planes he made from metal as ornaments in his spare time and a cigarette lighter. He is rather ingenious in that way. He showed me a dozen tricks with glasses, coins, etc. At 5 p.m. we sat down to tea. I expected tea and cookies, but they call tea dinner. We had chips, eggs, fish, and cauliflower. Also tea, four kinds of pastry, bread, and butter. It was all very good and tasty. They have so many plates and so much silver that I had to watch my step very closely in order not to commit a breach of etiquette. After tea, we all sat and talked, and at about 6.30 p.m., I suggested that Eleanor and I start to town to go dancing as we prearranged. I thanked them very much for the fine time and tea and told them that all that I hoped that I could call again and see them. They told me I must call again at any time I could and that they enjoyed my company very much. From the Simpsons, it was off, on a off to a cafe where Eleanor had a gin and two drambuies while Richardson knocked back a gin, four scotches and four beers. From there, they went to the Cavendish, a large dance hall. I can't dance those damn Scottish waltzes very well, he admitted. But nevertheless, the couple danced a lot. It was very hot in there, or maybe it was the drinks, Richardson wrote later. I felt very good, sweat just rolling from my brow. I thought more of Eleanor right there after sitting a moment, thinking about the day and what I had seen already. Also, after meeting some of her girlfriends at the dance, than any girl I've ever known, he confided in his diary. So surely, she surely is one sweet gal, demure, pretty, intelligent, and lovely. The couple caught the 1045 bus back to Blairno, the blast bus, and since Richardson knew it was his last liberty with the Wichita ready to leave dry dock the next day, he decided to walk the eight miles back to Edinburgh rather than take the bus so that he would spend more time with Eleanor. She was hoping it wouldn't give her an awful reputation in town walking home with a sailor, and I can readily see her point. However, she said she didn't care and put her arm around me and hugged me tight. It made me feel good inside to hear her say that she knew one sailor whom she wasn't ashamed of. I smiled, that's all. It was raining a little and quite dark when we walked to the gate and stopped and clutched each other and kissed. Never have I been so thrilled. After about 10 minutes of that, we went inside where we continued to hold each other close. She made some tea for us. I think she was becoming too excited and it was a good excuse, but I liked the display of tact, he recalled. Getting back to the Wichita proved to be difficult. He needed to be back to the ship early or be declared AWOL. At 1 a.m., Eleanor got our coat and walked me to the gate in inky blackness. We kissed and vowed to write to each other. She will send me her picture. And as I kissed her the last time, she whispered love and good wishes and quick returns in my ear. Said she'd pray for me each night. I also admitted my love for her the first time. I started down the road, my head spinning in delight and couldn't see a thing. Never had I dreamed of meeting anyone so nice over here. I mean it when I say I've seen some of the most beautiful girls ever in Scotland. Richardson's challenges didn't end there. Never have I seen it so dark, he wrote. There are no cars, no lights, just blackout. He walked on in the rain, peacoat collar turned up around his neck, dreaming. About halfway to Edinburgh, he came to a fork in the road and stood there wondering which road to take. Fortunately, a car came along and he stopped the driver to ask which way. It was a taxi and the driver offered to give him a ride. When Richardson told him he didn't have any money for the fare, the driver hesitated, then called him in and offered to give him a ride, calling it a gift. He told Richardson he was crazy to walk that far in the rain just to see a girl and would have never found the right road back till morning. He dropped Richardson off in front of the Red Cross and the young sailor went in and slept on the floor of the lounge. Every bed and chair was full and so were the floors, he, he recalled. I had a miserable sleep of very pleasant thoughts, he told his diary. I awakened many times to sit up and think of Eleanor, but did not let her distract me to the extent that I forgot to say prayers for home and the folks. What a wonderful day, the best perhaps in my life. 
The following day, Richardson continued to have serious thoughts of his relationship with Eleanor. If we grow fonder as time goes by, I have no doubt that I might make a serious move sometime in the future. I was thinking today how to raise my rate soon and how to learn more faster. I remember Mr. Simpson saying last night that they pay 10 shillings on the pound in income tax or 50% or one half their earnings. But two days after meeting Eleanor's family, Richardson and the Wichita sailed from Edinburgh for Scapa Flow. I, same as the rest, hate to leave Edinburgh. It surely has been a wonderful, beautiful place. Not only that, I really care a great deal about a certain person near Edinburgh. I right now vow that I will and shall come back here sometime soon and see and perhaps marry Eleanor. I shan't rush things too much. I hate to think of not seeing Eleanor again for perhaps months. My thoughts have turned again and again today to her. I really think she is a wonderful girl, perhaps the woman I should like to have for a wife. I know I enlisted for two years, but it doesn't make much difference, for I'm sure I'll be discharged as soon as the war is over, if I live that long. If I am in here for four years, I'll get married before I get out. Also, if I marry, I'll be more than third class, and it will be Eleanor if she, content, if she consents. I think she will. As the Wichita sailed for Scapa Flow, Richardson's thoughts seemed to crowd together. I thought a dozen times at least of Eleanor today, also of home and Bob and Joe and my brothers. I shall probably soon see the icebergs, Iceland, ice flows, fock wolves, subs, and the deadly North Atlantic before long. God preserve us all, please, for we all have a lot to live for, but first comes our country. We know we have the best one in the world for we've seen a lot of what is termed the second best, Britain. All I ask for myself and family and friends dear to me as well as shipmates are good health, happiness, success, and God's blessing. That sentence has made up a good deal of my nightly prayers since I was 16 years old. Unfortunately for Richardson and Eleanor, the USS Wichita had developed a propeller vibration and was ordered to return to the United States for repairs. On August 14th, the cruiser left Scapa Flow for New York. As the British battleship King George V sounded a farewell bugle call for the Americans, Richard wrote, Richardson wrote, a strange feeling crept over me. Tears trickled down a number of cheeks as the boys stood frozen. I felt as if I had lost a home as Scapa's familiar sight faded behind. It was barren, desolate, but safe, peaceful, secure, a wonderful harbor, and the stronghold of the grand fleet of a people whom I have come to like and love, who love freedom as much if not more than we do, a people who are friendly, kind, proud, defiant, articulate, determined. They love fun as much as we, joking, games, laughter, dancing, but they are methodical and never jump or hurry. Never have I felt closer and stronger bound to the British ally of ours than now. I have begun to understand them better, they can't be liked until you know and understand them. As we slipped out of Scapa, the sun made a beautiful red glare on the green islands, camouflage ships and docks, and the blue water beyond. It's a sight I shall never forget. We were out in the open sea and went up to about 20 knots or better. I dashed below as soon as secure sounded, for I wanted no one to see my eyes wet, though a number of others were the same way. I could have almost cried outright, but I had to suppress it. You never think of crying when you're in danger or under fire. We must never taste defeat no matter what the cost. I have lived with and talked to and befriended many of these people over here. And after that, I realize what the war has been and means to them. We know no hardships in the US compared to these people. We have no taxes, no ruins, no lives lost to what they have sustained. May God bless us, Britain and the King and all his people. I've seen them laugh at bombs, smile in the face of danger, give up half their salaries and taxes, send their sons to death, serving their country, cut their meals in half, and still they are as determined as ever and smile just the same. They extend the same kindness and hospitality to you, offer you half of anything they have, fight you or anyone else for what they think is right. That is what I call a nation and a spirit and a people undefeated. Surely I shall be glad to get home but I shall surely miss Britain, Eleanor, and Edinburgh. I love Eleanor Simpson, Simpson because she and her family are symbolic of all of the above, as well as for other personal reasons. Despite Richardson's prediction that the Wichita would continue to escort Allied convoys to Murmansk, 
The heavy cruiser never returned to Europe. On October 24, 1942, Wichita left the States to participate in Operation Torch, the Allied invasion of North Africa. Following that operation, the cruiser sailed for the Pacific and fought in the Aleutians, the Marshalls, the Palau's, New Guinea, the Marianas, the Philippines, and Okinawa, earning an impressive 13 battle stars. Richardson spent the remainder of the war on the Wichita, with the exception of six days in the Naval Hospital in Bremerton, Washington, and leaves home to Langhorne, Pennsylvania in October 1943 and January 1945. He returned to the United States for good in July 1945 and was honorably discharged from the Navy that October. There's no mention of Eleanor Simpson in Richardson's diary after he left Scotland, although it's possible that he continued to write her for a time, as there is a gap in his diary for more than a year. After the war, Richardson married, had three children, and went to work for Simplex Time Recorder Company. He lived in Toledo, Ohio, Gardner, Massachusetts, and Saddle River and Ridgewood, New Jersey, and died in 1976 at the age of 55. Eleanor, married in 1949, had two daughters, and moved to England. In 2018, I was able to contact one of her daughters. She informed me that Eleanor was still alive, age 97, but she had no memories of Richardson. Her daughter asked me to respect her privacy, and I have abided by that request. In the midst of the bloodiest war in human history, a young American sailor far from home for the first time found himself in a strange land, doubtful that his country's allies could defeat Nazi Germany. Within a few weeks, however, he found new respect and appreciation for those helping his nation in the struggle to defeat fascism. No doubt this new admiration was intensified as a result of a passionate but fleeting romance with a young Scottish lass. That relationship also helped him cope with the prospect of a very uncertain future and deadly work ahead. Thanks to his desire to document his experiences in defiance of Navy regulations, more than 75 years later, we have been given a rare look at the thoughts and emotions of ordinary people struggling to survive in extraordinary times. Thank you very much for listening.